Eh? We're going to um, just, I just want to do a really quick intro because uh, I want to let Cindy get going. She's got, she's loaded for bear tonight, let me just tell you. She's ready. Um, so let's go to that first side, please, after this one. I'd like to just remind you, you know, how we're doing the class. It's a little different for some people. So we give you uh, a YouTube audio uh, for the upcoming teaching. So next week we'll be talking about forgiveness. If you get a chance to listen to this audio, it will help you. It's about an hour long and uh, covers a lot of the material. And then also um, read the next two chapters, which is on the next um, slide, right? So that's chapters five and six which I think says page 97. So if you guys have been doing your reading, you've already read almost 100 pages in Transforming the Inner Man. Anybody doing the reading? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one guy I talked to uh, said, man, that book is messing me up, man. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, that's what we want to hear. Not really, you know, we're not trying to be mean. But um, it, 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 he said exactly what I said probably would happen, is that stuff will get stirred up. And tonight's class, you know, probably going to fit that bill. So it's good that forgiveness is next week. Because sometimes when, like I'll just give you my example, when I heard the performance orientation uh, teaching, which was the first one of all the Elijah House teachings that my wife gave me a cassette tape for way back when in the prehistoric you know, caveman days of cassette tapes, um, I was angry because I was remembering in the course of my life who was putting that performance orientation on me, who was putting that demand on me, and always dangling the blessing just out of my reach. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how much I did, I never got the blessing. I always had to work harder. And that's a really losing strategy, right? So I got angry, and like that's a normal thing. But you can't hang on to that anger, right? It's, it's meant to be processed and flushed out, and forgiveness is the only way. It's a supernatural thing. Forgiveness is supernatural. So the more you can dig in and read about it and listen to it, that'll help you next week when you come. You'll be prepared for what we're going to teach. Um, so those two chapters, and then you can go to the next one, uh, please. And this will be where Cindy's going to start. I just want to give you a little background on Cindy because um, is that, I'm just curious. Is anybody here a professional counselor? where you have a uh, counseling practice. So nobody's raising your hand, so um, you might not understand some of the difficulties you face when you have that kind of a job. She's not a professional counselor because she's not getting paid to do it. We do prayer ministry here, not professional counseling. You need licenses and de you know, de designations to be a counselor uh, in the psychology field. And we don't charge fees, right? So everything that we do here is just a blessing from the church. You don't have to pay anything when you come. So we don't call it really counts. We call it prayer ministry. The difficult, well, there's many difficult things about it. First of all, you're hearing people's pain at a high level, you know, because they're not usually coming in here because everything's going well. They're coming in here because they got a problem. And, you know, they realize that there's a deeper root. Um, so to be in that kind of mode often, like almost every day, and have hours of time in the counseling room, you have to be pretty disciplined in your spirit not to let it get to you personally. Or even sometimes when you're hearing some of the pain that people have experienced, it gets emotional. We're human beings too, right? The counselors have feelings, and the prayer ministers are like empathizing with these folks. So we have to learn. Won't do it in this series, but there's a, another teacher called Burden Bearing. Right, So the thing that attracts you to trying to help people could end up being hurtful, and you could carry that stuff home with you, and then all of a sudden you're, you're down. So she's had to learn how to discipline her spirit to know what's God's and what's mine. Where, where do I step in and where do I just have to turn this over and trust God? It's, uh, it's not for everybody, I can tell you. It, it takes a certain constitution to want to keep coming back in and, and doing that every day. But like we just sang, who the sun sets free is free indeed. And when you could see somebody's life change by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is really what this is about, the prophetic gift of the Holy Spirit speaking to us and causing that shift, there's nothing like it. Like there's just such a power in seeing people's lives change. So um, I, I give her a lot of credit and you have to give honor where honors do. And the, the laborer who works is worthy of uh, the, those accolades that she has diligently worked 
One tiny little story I'll give you to show you how far she's come. Because uh, part of the problem that you face when you're counseling people and teaching the word all the time is that you're constantly hearing the word and you have to do it. <laughs> because if you're telling other people what to do, you can't you know, contradict it and then try to you know, shake out of it yourself. So if it's good for the geese, it's good for whatever I am. The gander, I guess, is how it goes, right? Like We can't tell other people to do it and then not do it ourselves. And that's very convicting. <laughs> So anyway, way back when, when we first started the church, Cindy was here at the very first Bible study we did in uh, the firehouse in Basking Ridge where people are voting tonight, um, 1999, 20-plus years ago. And uh, I met with her, and then we went and did an event as a church. We went down to Lancaster. Oh, sorry, Siri, you're not on right now. Uh, we went down to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she was in charge of making that all work for us. And I don't remember what the specific problem was, but the, the, she, I'm sure she does. The event didn't go as planned, and she was upset, and that's understandable. But, you know, that's kind of what performance orientation does. You, you take your identity and what you do, and if you, something goes wrong, you blame yourself. And instead of having a good time and enjoying it and kind of letting it roll off your back and like, see, oh, well, you know, everybody here is friends. We're going to be okay. You, you kind of take it inside. And um, today that wouldn't happen. I know that wouldn't happen today because she got free. <laughs> you know, and it's a really awesome thing to get free where that thing that used to really, you know, invade your space 24-7 is now gone. And you can laugh at that thing. And you can say, I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who he says I am, not who my football coach said or my father or whoever, that negative cursing thing. I am who he says I am. Amen? So would you welcome Cindy as she comes to teach? Thank you to the patience of Pastor and Pastor Peter and Pastor Tricia, <laughs> that I'm free <laughs> because Holy Spirit does his job, but it takes a lot of patience on the pe part of people <laughs> that you're um, getting ministered to from because I was a tough case, I could tell you that. And all I wanted to know was when I was going to be fixed. Well, we learned it's a process. And even in this, I've, I've taken this class probably 19 times <laughs> at least. I've been in the class or taught it at least 19 times. So the Holy Spirit was still showing me things, even today. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is awesome. So I am so fired up right now. I am so fired up. He was showing me things as I was sitting in here in worship tonight. I am fired up. So I want freedom because it's bondage. Performance orientation is bondage. Nothing less than bondage. And... I remember back in the day when we took that, it was 19 weeks, um, five hours, four hours a day, a small group after, every Friday for 19 weeks. And, and Pastor would call me on some classes and say, this one's going to be really hard for you. You know, get up and walk out if you have to get up and walk out. And there was plenty of times I had to get up and walk out and plenty of times that the guy who was teaching it would say to me, crying again okay you just sit there I'll take care of you after class <laughs> but I worked the process and you know what we like Jack Frost who was one of my heroes in the faith who went to be with the Lord pastor told a story about him last week and um, it's experiencing the father's love right embrace that's what I thought and I said love last week um, embrace is an incredible book and if you have never read it I tell you it's a must read for every Christian and then slavery to sonship I used to say when I grow up I want to be like Jack yeah. I want to be like Jack I want to see people get free and I want to see them understand the heart of the father and even as I was um, going through performance orientation I was listening to the Lord I'm like Lord what is it what is it like give me something that I haven't seen before in this and all I could hear today was it really is about a revelation of the Father's love. Performance orientation goes away when you understand that you're not an orphan, that you have a Father that loves you, and you walk into the place out of orphanhood, orphanship or whatever it is, and into the place of the Father's love. 
as Pastor was saying, roll off your back, it rolls off your back. Because when you know that you're loved, it doesn't matter what somebody else thinks about you because you know that the father loves you and it was funny because i didn't know pastor was going to do worship tonight and i text him i said are you doing worship because i had picked a song and we both picked the same song <laughs> so it's it is god wants you to know that you are his child and he loves you and he loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you. When you pick the daisy, there's never a petal that says he doesn't love you. It's no petal that says he loves you not. It's he loves you, he loves you. A long time ago, the Lord gave me a, a vision of me sitting on a curb as a little girl, and I was pulling the daisy, because daisies are one of my favorite, like, carefree flowers. <laughs> Peonies are my favorite, but I love daisies because of that. And I just saw myself picking it, and I kept waiting for the one that was going to, like, he loves me not, and just kept saying, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. So um, we're going to start with Galatians 3, 1 through 3. This is the, um, the Sanfords are also amazing. If you haven't read the book, please read the book, because you will get so much out of it. And... Um, it will transform your life if you let it through the Holy Spirit. So this is the uh, verse that they use for this lesson. I'm going to read it out of the message because I think it tells, says it um, the best way. It says, you crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened. For it is obvious the obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus in your lives. He sacrifices on the, his sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did you begin a new life? Was it by working of your head, working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own effort what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough, to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? It is not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. Wow. Say la. <laughs> Say la. Listen to it in the voice. It kind of is even better. It says, do you think I care about the approval of men or about the approval of God? Do you think I am on a mission to please people? If I am still spinning my wheels trying to please men, then there is no way I can be a servant of the anointed one, the liberating king. Amen? Amen? I mean, those are kind of ouch. I say ouch without the sting. And I'm going to read you a, a little thing out of the book. It said, the constant propensity of a Christian is to fall back to striving by human efforts. Our minds and spirits know the free gift of salvation, but our heart retains their habit to earn love by performing. The internal structure of performance orientation forms an obstinate area of unbelief in the hearts of most, um, among Christians. Most commonly, we are... Um, we who are saved are unaware or bewitched, like it says in Galatians, that other motives than God's love has begun to corrupt our serving into striving, tension, and fear by sus uh, suspecting we fail to know which, why, and what wrong motives. So when I got saved, this is one of the revelations the Lord gave me this week that I had never seen in all the years I've done this. I always attributed it to something else. I never realized it was performance orientation. So when I got saved, I was a good Catholic girl. I loved God. Um, and I always tried to do the right thing. I tried. Didn't mean I always did, but I tried. And Because you never wanted to commit a mortal sin, right? So 
And I always went to confession and, you know, I always tried to do the right thing. So when I got saved and I heard that it was a free gift, I was so excited. I thought, this is awesome. But just like what I just read, all of a sudden, a little while into it, I started to get nervous because I thought, oh my goodness, I can't earn my way anymore. I can't earn it anymore. I can't light candles. I can't go to confession. I can't have somebody pray me out of purgatory. I can't do any of those things that I thought I could do. And I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? How am I going to do this? And it sent me into a tailspin of anxiety and panic disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. It was over the top trips to the hospital, trips to the psychiatrist. I mean, it tipped me over the edge because all of a sudden I was afraid that I couldn't get to heaven if I did the wrong thing anymore. I had no way to do it. And I realized this week when I was studying, I was thought I had to perform for God, even as a believer, I couldn't accept the free gift. I thought I still had to earn it. And there was no way to do that. So I was in this quandary that sent me into six months of taking, I forget what anxiety medicine it was, but I was like, I'm not doing this for too long. But it got me through. And, um, but that's what happened because I thought I could earn it. I thought I could be good enough. And then I realized, oh, gosh, he just did this. It's a free gift. It didn't compute in my head. And I performed and performed and performed until it started to make me go a little crazy. Now, in Hebrews 3.12 in the Amplified, it says, The peril of unbelief. Take care, brothers and sisters, that there, um, that there may there not be in any way any one of you, a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. And that's what I had done because I thought I had to earn it and I couldn't trust God. I couldn't trust what he, he told me. I had to try and figure it out myself. My brain was always trying to figure it out, always trying to figure out how I was going to protect myself. So performance orientation is a term which refers to this not to the service we perform, but the false motives which impel us to do it. It's about the false motives that we use. When we bring performance orientation to death, it doesn't mean you're going to stop serving. It just means you're going to not serve out of the wrong motives anymore. And when I, I kept going over that in my head, and the Lord said to me, You'll, I'll, I'll read what he said. He said, he said, you will do it bec not because, um, you will do it because you want to do it after it comes to death, not because you have to do it. It's going to change from w wanting to do it and not having to do it. When you're performing, you have to do it. You have to do it. Because otherwise, you're not going to be loved. When it switches, you could still do the same things. I still do the same things I did. But I do it because I want to do it. Yeah. Not because I'm going to earn the love for it. Right. The primary cause... Uh, go ahead, Manny. Yes. So, yes, the a, mic is open if you have a question. I, so I have a question. Good. So... Right now, you're talking about serving God in the capacity of ministry. So when I got saved, my thought process wasn't so much ministry. It was fighting the battle of sin. So for the first three to five years, I find myself on my face in my car in prayer because, you know, this flesh just doesn't die. And it got to the point where I was striving with God about the things I couldn't take care of. 
So you talk about the performance side in ministry, but what about the bondage you can find yourself in on the flip side of it, trying to battle the battle that we've never been able to conquer? Just to clarify, when I did get to that point where I just it was over for me, I couldn't do it anymore, that's when I heard God's voice say, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And the load came off, but the battle still continues. So I'm just wondering, how do you equal that out from ministry to walking in the faith and trying to remain separate and sanctified from the ways of the world? Okay, if, if it sounded in, at all like I was just talking about ministry in my own life, I'm talking about life in general. In, in any way, in any way where we struggle, in anything, whether it's control, whether it's manipulation in our relationships, whether it's anger, or any of those things where you're, you're trying to do the right thing for God, but you're not, and then you think he doesn't love you because of that. It's, whether it's ministry or, or your life, we still try to perform to get God to love us because God knows what we're made of. And I do believe if we're seeking God with all our heart and we're struggling, God knows that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. It's a very deep question because all of us struggle in one way or another. I mean, no matter how seasoned of a Christian you are, you don't have everything handled. Paul said I have, he hadn't arrived, right? So if he hadn't arrived, I doubt any of us have. And the goal is be transformed into the image of Christ who only did the things he saw his father doing and uh, heard his father saying, right? So that's a goal that we're shooting for. The law was given to prove that we couldn't do it, <laughs> right? Like it's not bad. The law's not bad. This is the whole book of Romans, right? And many other portions of scripture. So it gets us to a breaking point where we start the day on our knees saying, Lord, I know today if I try to do this in my strength, I'm, I'm going to fail. Um, it's, it's kind of wired that way because of sin in the world. So I need your grace to be sufficient for me and help me to forgive myself when I mess up today and help me to be quick to respond when I realize I made a mistake. I was telling somebody, we, we, we're going to be posting a video by Bill Johnson, and he said you know, he had uh, almost had a car crash on the highway and he was really mad at the other driver. The other driver did something really sketchy. That never happens around here, but out in California. You know. <laughs> So it's like a little flesh test during the middle of the day. And he's with his kids in the back seat. And he reacted, you know. And you can understand it. He was scared for a minute. But he told his, he apologized to his kids in the car. He said, look, that's not who I want to be. And then he looked at his wife and said, I'm not just giving you permission to talk to me if you see that. I want you to be proactive in telling me when you think um, I'm shifting into that gear of getting in my flesh. So that's a pretty... That's a pretty secure person to say that, right? Because we're typically very defensive about it. So you can't work your way to something good on the inside. That's another thing John Sanford says. You can't peel back and find good. <laughs> right? It's got to die. And you you got to depend totally on Jesus. And specifically, whatever the struggle is still, even after, you know, it's frustrating because you're reading the word, you're going to church, you think you're going to see improvement, and poof, it should just go away which is why she said, how come I'm not fixed yet? <laughs> it's a legitimate question, but it's not, we're not trying to get fixed. We're trying to die and be resurrected. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, it's a way more painful, <laughs> but better on the other side in the resurrection, right? Like when, when we get resurrected into the new person, the, the striving stops and you get this ability to forgive yourself right. f- way faster and your mate and your kids and other people that mess up because you keep saying but for the grace of God that could be me too right Mike microphone not Mike oh, oh. yeah no Manny I mean, I mean I know we hear we must die right I'm still grappling Paul with that Sanford concept. did you get to listen to the um, audio this week uh, anybody no, remember her testimony she went all the way through and got through her senior year in high school how many A's did she get all A's except one B one B plus that ruined the whole thing, <laughs> the B-plus. See, that's what had to die, seeing her value in what she could accomplish, right? Because the B-plus, can you imagine? Like all straight A's the whole way through, how 
you know, like she probably deserved a day in that class too, but the teacher was just maybe digging something in. You just, you can't control what the other people are doing. You can only control how you react. And if you're going to let that hijack you, you have your priorities in the wrong place. So, you know, you can fight the grade and you can do all this, but it should never cause you to feel like your stock price dropped. I'm a stockbroker, so I think that way. You're not bankrupt as a person just because you made a mistake, because we all make them. It's just, what are you going to do with it? Because like, the example I gave last week was people get stressed out and they go to the pantry and they get carbs and they just, you know, right. peanut butter and Ben and Jerry's and whatever can make me feel good in the moment. But that really ends up making you feel worse in the long right. run. So when that thing gets nipped in the bud and you realize, no, that's a counterfeit affection. Now all of a sudden, it's not that you didn't make a mistake anymore, but you don't compound the mistake by, you know, I'm a loser. I'm a, why bother? Let me just do it anyway because... You know, I can't win. I'm never going to change. Exactly what the devil wants. And the answer is no. If there's fruit, if there's still a struggle, that just means there's a root in there that we got to get to. And I didn't mean to take so long with that answer. So. Awesome. And that is the thing. There's a root. It's getting to the root of it because we could keep cutting the dandelion off or even go a little bit deeper than, the, you know, sometimes I pull out the weeds and I get more than just the top of it. But I don't get the whole little base, and then I'm not digging my fingers in the dirt. Um, or if I get it, then I'm like, ah, oh, forget it. I just don't feel like I want to get the little shovel. And then it comes back. But God rewards those who diligently seek after him, Manny. And if, in any one of us, not just Manny, any one of us, where we are diligently seeking after freedom, God's going to bring it. And... Even no matter what the sin is, we still don't have to perform for God because he loves us because he loves us. And there's nothing. That's one of the scriptures I have. There's nothing that can separate us from his love. Nothing. Nothing. No sin is so great. that. And as long as we are pressing into the Lord, and you know, he's there. All right, so... I also never really thought about this before, but um, performance orientation is really a form of self-protection because we're just trying to protect ourselves. We're trying to protect ourselves from rejection. We're trying to protect ourselves from rejection from the Father, even though he never will reject us. The only one who's rejected is Satan. We know that. And he tries to project onto us what he is, but... No matter what, we don't need to protect ourselves. We do a really bad job of it. We do a really bad job of it. So as we, um, the more we learn how much he loves us, and we don't have to protect ourselves because he does, the more um, performance orientation will f go away as well. Performance orientation operates out of a base of fear and insecurity, a fear of rejection, in um, 1 John 4.18 in the Amplified, it says, There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. So, no, so the one who is afraid of God's judgment, which is really feels like rejection, is not perfected in love has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. In 1 Timothy 1.17, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And in um, Romans 8, 38 through 39 in the Amplified, this is what I just quoted before, is for I am convinced and to continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither life Death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present or threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any created thing, including performance orientation, will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So performance orientation, we are performing to earn the love that's already been given to us. I remember um, the Elijah House counselor said to me one day, I was really frustrated about something. And he said, I kept saying, but so-and-so just doesn't love me. 
He said, Cindy, you probably wear the people out in your life that love you. He said, because they love you, but you can't receive it. And I called it the ouches without stings because I was like, ouch. It was true, though, because I already had it. And I kept thinking I tried to earn it, but I already had it, but I couldn't even see it that I had it. And not just with people I love, with God. I kept, okay, if I just do it a little better, if I just do a little more, if I just do a little more, God's really going to love me now. If I just spend a couple more hours doing this, he'll really love me. If I do five or ten ministries, he'll really love me. Pastor, you said to me, you can't do everything. <laughs> I tried. So what happens in performance orientation is our hearts laminate two things together that should be separated. It laminates together behaving well and performing and being loved. And you know if you laminate something, it's almost impossible to pull it apart. I have tried. You know like when there's a little corner and it's kind of like not all sticky? I love pulling things like that apart. And I, I've tried. It's like impossible when it gets laminated, right? You try to? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so anyway... But God's love whoosh, separates it. The power of forgiveness separates it. Performance orientation is not a behavior. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of our heart. It's an acceptance of a lie about us that is built in it like infancy almost sometimes. And it acts and operates automatically. It's kind of like walking and talking. You don't have to think about talking, especially girls, right? We don't have to think about talking. We could talk. I talk to myself. I'm like, sometimes I think you're talking to yourself again. Um, but you, you do. You just do it automatically. You get up and you walk. It's automatic. Unless you're in pain, it's automatic. Well, that's kind of how uh, performance orientation works. When you are so embedded in it, here are some of the things that come off of it where you could identify it. People pleasing, workaholism, compulsiveness, self-righteousness, overachieving in school, work or home, codependence, never saying no, underachievers, so others' expectations are not disappointed. What about that one? Think about that one. Most people only just think about the overachiever. Perfectionist, must be perfect or you won't do it. There's no allowing for mistakes when you're in performance orientation for you or the people in your life. Now, I was a poster child. This is an area, so Manny, here, might, maybe this is uh, something that will relate to what you were saying. So this one, not allowing for mistakes even with others. Even as I was looking at this, and I know the Lord's been already working on it with me, but I have a really hard time with that. I want the people in my life to be perfect because it's a reflection on me. And God has really taken me, if the Richter scale, uh, what is that? The angle scale? We'll say the angle scale. The angle scale goes from here is zero and here's 100. I moved from zero to probably 60 or 70, but I'm not there yet. They will still tell me, I can't be perfect for you, mom. Or I can't be perfect for you, my husband will say. I can't be. But in my head, I still expect it sometimes. So is it God's not going to love me? He sees that I'm trying. I, I pray and ask him. I repent and I repent and ask for forgiveness every time I do it, which I never did before. So I'm moving closer to it, but it's still not there yet. Similar to what you're thinking? No, my, my whole issue was because my father left, you know, the love of God took over, so I performed for him. Oh, I'm sorry. My situation was different because when my father left, I didn't know what it was like to have one, so I had no identity, I had no security. So when Christ comes into my life and God is there, I find myself, wow, you know, I have to be good or else, you know, he's yeah. not going to be there for me. 
So it just was one of these perpetuating things right. that you know, um, kept going. Okay, we're going to do this. Yeah. Just I want to apologize on the behalf of ministers that do that to people. I don't even know if it's on purpose that they do it. They want they could have the same issue that Cindy was having. My identity is based on how my people act in my church because if they don't act well, that means I'm a bad minister. <laughs> So let's just finish the point. So if I got a problem, if somebody in the church has a problem, I might say, you can't say anything about that problem. You'll bring a reproach on the ministry. Wow. I'm not making that up. I heard that quoted, okay? So if it's in the ministry, it can really be toxic because, like you said, you didn't have a dad, so you're looking to godly men when you became a Christian. And if there's any performance orientation there, and we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Love believes the best. They're doing the best they can. They never read this book. We never got, you know, training in this. So it's like, well, I'm just going to be the strict coach. You know, sometimes you got to grab the guy by the face mask and shake the helmet. And, you know, like fear works. That will motivate people for a while, won't it? But love is a way better motivator. That's what Jesus used. Love is way better than fear. Sorry, I know you No, I know, I know where you're going with that. One of the things that I was just looking at the other day and it sort of struck me was that there was a, something on Facebook that says the only Jesus that people will ever see is the Jesus in you. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, these people are not getting saved if they're looking at me. Because if they're looking at me, they're looking at the wrong person, right? All I can do is just bring them to Christ. No, no, be careful, though, because that's part of a mindset that is, is not what God says about you. You don't have to be perfect in order for him to love you. None of us are. He's been using broken people for 2,000 years to build the kingdom. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against, what did he say? My church, not the church, his church. And if it's really his church, that kind of thinking will, will go away because you recognize, you know what? I can't be perfect. So if, if, if you're counting on perfect behavior to get people to Christ, no. What happens is people recognize that you're flawed, but that you have a God that forgives you for it, and then they want that. You could call out all their problems, like Joe, religious guy, but then they find problems in you too, and then you look like a hypocrite, right? But if, if you can acknowledge to them that, hey, man, I'm really sorry. I didn't like the way I spoke to you yesterday. Will you forgive me? Very few people do that in the world, right? So it's not that you're perfect that it draws them to Christ. It's that they see the Christ in you that's broken and, and still trying. And like David, he's a man after. And you are a man after God's own heart. So don't think that if they're looking at you, they're not going to accept the Lord. That, I don't think that's true about you at all. I think you're a great godly example. Could you be more like Christ? Anybody here going to say no to that? Of course. Yes. But you're way further than you were, man. All right, so let's go back to the lie for a second that we were just saying that those are all lies, right? They're all lies. So I am not loved because I just exist. I'm only loved if I perform. I am only part of a family if I perform the way they find acceptable, right? So I gave you this little paper. You got this when you came in? All right. You didn't get one? All right, so on here, while I'm talking, just fill in the blanks because we're going to pray through it at the end, okay? If I don't, I won't be loved. In order to be loved, I must, okay? I was uh, at a worship night the other night, and I heard this, the, the, uh, the pastor came out in the middle, and he was talking about, a surrender, and he said something, and I quick ran to my seat and typed it in my phone because I was like, oh, this is performance orientation at its finest. He said, how many of you have heard, bring God your best? Bring God your best. If you've heard that, raise your hand. Okay, everybody. Bring God your best. Bring God your best. Well, that's performance orientation. Bring God your best. What about your worst? Cain. What, Manny? Cain. <laughs> what about your worst? What about your pain? What about the parts that are ugly? 
he won't love you. Right? It's a lie. It's a bold-faced lie. God said, bring me all of you. All of you. The best, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I am so grateful for the people in my life that I have, like with flesh on, that I could bring the good, bad, and the ugly to. And they still love me. How much more is my Heavenly Father going to still love me? And guess what? It's like the time that I found out my son had a hole in his heart when he was um, nine months old. And when we went back to the doctor and he said, okay, well, the hole didn't close and he's going to have to have open heart surgery when he's 18 months old. And I'm like uh, a mess. But I'm trying. I had just gotten saved. So I was trying to be this really strong Christian because my husband wasn't saved yet. And I'm like, oh, I've got to be strong. I'm going to perform. I'm going to do this right for God. I'm not going to make God look bad to my husband. And my husband goes, come here. Can you just sit on my knee for a second? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm doing great. And he looked at me and he said, would you just be real? He said, now this was my unsaved husband. He said, would you just be real with God? Because I, I know that God knows what's in your heart and what you're thinking anyway. He said, so I don't know why you're pretending you're okay with him. Because you're not okay. And no, no mom's going to be okay with her 18-month-old having open-heart surgery. So, but I had to be the good Christian. I had to perform for God. Because God, I didn't want my husband, who was unsaved, to think that I wasn't like, steadfast in this God that I wanted him to get to know. And he's telling me, I think God knows what's in your heart, so why don't you just tell him that you're scared and that you're not real happy about this? And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. It's true. He knows everything in our heart anyway. He knows the thoughts before we think him. He knows what we're going to think till the day we go home to be with him. And he chose the cross. He loved us that much, knowing every single thing we would do wrong. He hung on the cross knowing what we don't know yet. We don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now. We don't know what could happen. But he does, and he still went to the cross for us. That's how much he loves us. That he went to the cross, and we're still trying to perform to make him love us. When I, when I just said that, I want to cry. Like, that must grieve his heart. That he went to the, he sent his only son to the cross to prove how much he loved us. And we're still trying to earn it through performing for him. Say, La, forgive us, Father. Forgive us, Father. In performance orientation... Oh, go ahead. Yes, you could say something. <laughs> could she say something? <laughs> yes. Well, one of the things that I'm thinking of is a lot of times we, we project, like Manny, what you were saying about your dad. Your dad left when you were a little boy, I guess. Is that what it was? So we project onto God what we've experienced through our parents, right? So a lot of times, even though we know that God is God, he died on the cross, but we still have the abandonment issue in our heart. Or we can have the disinterested. You know, like he worked three jobs. Now, we know that he was working to provide for the family, but as a kid, you're interpreting it as, He's not interested in me because he's working three jobs. You see, so you have abandonment. You have an abusive dad that even though you know that God wouldn't harm you, but, you know, you, you keep a distance from him because, again, it's more of a covert thing. And that's what you have to say. Okay, Lord, what is it that's keeping, if there's a wall, I just met with someone yesterday who said, I don't know what it is. As long as I'm saved, I just, there's a wedge here that, now, her dad happened to be really abusive, violent. And so I said, well, he may want to, you know, address some of the root issues here regarding your dad. And, you know, there's layers and you've had a lot of healing. But sometimes we project that covertly 
our expression or our feeling of what we've experienced from our parents, our, you know, our dad in this particular case, onto God. So if you're having still that issue, because then it's striving. Well, you know, like, all right, my dad's not there. Well, I have to keep performing and keep doing whatever. So then this way he'll hear me, you know. And my thing was my dad worked a lot of jobs. So my thing was God wasn't too interested. So I was like, ugh, you know, what's the point? Or I, I kind of stay behind with the Lord, not having an expectation. I mean, I knew God answered prayer, but when it came to me, I, I, I didn't think God really cared. I know how stupid that is. I know the scripture says that he loves us, but that's how I felt. Until I just really started to meditate, and I recognized that I looked at, and God said to me, you think I'm not interested in you. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and so then I had to shift that, and I repented for that. And I thought, wow. I, I, you know, he said, because when it comes down to you, like how many times are you able to pray for other people and you don't have a problem? But then when it comes to you, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you have more of an issue believing for yourself. And he said to me, he says, you have a real issue here. Now, in my particular case, I don't know if that's the same case for everybody. In my case, it was that he wasn't, he worked three jobs. I, he was never there. And then when he was there, I mean, he was good. I just didn't like him around because I wasn't used to having him there, you see. So just, just check your heart to see if there could be an area that there, it's, it's just ask Holy Spirit or, or you may know, is there something that I'm projecting an experience that I have with my dad onto God the Father that's hindering my relationship? And because that caused me to perform. That caused me to, if it wasn't 100%, Cindy and I really were poster childs for this. If it wasn't, I mean, I drove my husband nuts. I'd ask him, how did it go? Good, no, I don't believe you. And then if he said it really went well, I'm like, I don't, still didn't believe you. Or if he, no, I'm sorry, if he told me it didn't go well, then I was mad at him. So he, he, was, he was up a creek without a paddle. So he, <laughs> so anyway, but praise God, I've gotten healed. <laughs> and that is one of the, uh, things of performance orientation symptom thank you that is one of the symptoms of performance orientation exactly what pastor Trisha just said <laughs> um, you can also get performance orientation from uh, prenatally say if there was um, you you were born at the wrong time or your mother got pregnant out of wedlock and you know there was a lot of hubbub around your uh, Pre the pregnancy, you could think you have to earn your place because you weren't wanted. Maybe they said they were going to have an abortion. There's a lot of things around prenatal, so you have to be really careful no matter what the situation is. I was so grateful um, to know that, and I'll tell you that later, but um, it's very important because babies do feel their scientific proof the scientists have done studies, and it is scientifically proven that the babies feel and hear in, the, in utero. The other one is cultural. Cultural, you might, um, if you look at this little uh, thing up here, uh, culturally, there's different cultures that have a standard. There was a lady in our church a long time ago, and she was Asian, and, and I'm not saying anything about Asian people. I'm just saying in her culture, it was very high performance driven. And she got waitlisted at Harvard and it was like she was almost disowned. Can you imagine being waitlisted at Harvard and being disowned for that? I mean, I think that's pretty awesome. But in, in her culture, in her family, it wasn't okay. So that builds it and Where's that little thing? I have it. I think I cut it off my own page. So, all right. Well, we're going to pass it then because I cut it off my page. Okay. Lack of affection and laughter in a home um, where there's a lack of affection and huge demands to perform to please the parents at all costs, no rest, and no trust is built. Conditional love. Un uh, conditional love. They, Paul used the situation of potty training. Uh, like if a kid can't get their potty training, well, I mean, they're babies. They're babies. They're going to have accidents. All right? So 
Or conditional love, if you don't get all straight A's. There's lots of parents that if you don't get straight A's or if you play a sport and you don't hit a touchdown or you don't, you know, score so many points in a game, you're not loved or love is withheld. Now, my uh, one of my children was a high achiever and way after she graduated, she did the same thing that Paula did. She had straight A's all through high school and one B plus, and it was because there was a trauma in her life with a, a friend of ours. Something happened to a friend of ours, and she missed the test, and it cost her a B plus in one class. And later on after, we talked about it, and I said, we never put pressure on her, ever, 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 ever to perform, never. She goes, Mom, I heard you talk about performance orientation a million times. I performed because I never wanted to ever um, get out of your love. And one day she came home from college and she said to me, Mom, I have to tell you something and you're not going to love me. I said, when have I ever not loved you? And she told me and I said, I still love you. And she just wept because she thought she had done the sin that, you know, and it wasn't even a sin, what she did. I mean, it was just something she was telling me it was not a sin. I, I, I X that off the thing. It wasn't a sin. It was just something she was telling me. And I said, honey, I still love you the same way I loved you before. You don't get loved because you think the way I think. If you think something different, it's okay. But... Um, so conditional love is a big part of performance orientation. Unwise discipline is also another one. Go to your room, and if you listen to the CD or if you listened or read the book, you heard Paula say that um, go to your room until you could behave like you. Go to your room until you could behave the way you're supposed to and be a nice boy or be a nice girl. So I'm only loved when I'm a nice boy or a nice girl. I'm only loved when I look like what you, like and say what you want me to say. That's performance orientation. They need to be loved even when they're not at their best. Just like us. We want to be loved when we're not at their best. And I think sometimes as adults we forget what we want. You know, we want somebody to love us, but we're going to tell our kid, go to your room until you act the way I want you to act and come back when you're, you're a nice girl again or a nice boy again. Also, family values. And I love how they put it. There's a right way of doing things. And if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing right. In our family, we do it this way. Everything you do reflects on this family. How many of us heard that? How many of us heard, what happens in this house, you never say outside of this house? Yeah. How about both hands? <laughs> That's performance orientation. Just think what bondage that puts a kid in. If a kid's hurting and they feel like something's wrong and they can't go tell somebody. When I was a little kid, I used to think, like, I, my dream was to be able to go to a counselor there wasn't even counselors when I was a kid. I never even heard of anybody going to counseling. I wanted to go to a counselor so I could tell them everything that I thought and they wouldn't be able to tell anybody. That's what, that was my like, aspiration when I was a kid. I want to go to somebody so I could tell them all these things that I can never say because what happens in this house stays in this house. And I never did get to go, but now I get to do it. So I think it's kind of poetic justice on the enemy. So um, God is good. <laughs> um, but that's something that drives performance is you have to act a certain way to be in this family. And if you're not, it says to the kids, you're not part of the family. Position in the family, the first or the middle or the baby, competition and comparison. Have any of you struggled with that? Being compared to your siblings. I could say I never did, but I was always like thinking my sister was the favorite. 
but I never was compared. But that's a really hard thing because that tells you I better perform more so I could be loved like they're loved. If I perform like my sister or my brother, then I'll be loved like they're loved because how many of us know, let's be real, the easy kid in the family always seems like they're the one who's most loved. True? Because they're easy. It's not that they're most loved. It's just that they're easy. But so if you're being compared to that kid, you had the opposite? You have to go to the mic. That is true, but I also learned the opposite because the att good attention, bad attention. So, there, so I'm on, we're on Facebook, so I'll be discreet. So there was attention given to negative behavior. So I learned the opposite. So it wasn't, it was neglect. It wasn't like the good, be good, and then you get attention. It was be bad, and then you get attention. So it's not that I emulated that behavior, but it was the reverse in my house. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Okay, so recognizing the fruit of performance orientation. People with performance orientation do not have their own center of security. It is based solely on what other people think of them. <laughs> he thought that was good. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> People pleasing, it says in the word that it brings a curse on your life. People pleasing brings a curse on your life. Fear of man brings a, a snare. Is it a snare or a curse? I think one version says curse and one version says snare. All right. In a family where there is performance orientation, there is no rest. Not only measure it not only measures what you do what you're doing but everyone else is doing what everyone else is doing everyone needs to live up to the performance orientated performance orientated standard you must look good because i need to look good you keep your children under control so you look good you manipulate and control so you look good. Performance orientation in a family, even you need to make God look good. And this was a me, me, and me. Did I say that was me? That was me. Okay? When I'll go, I'm going to skip to the part where Paula talked about her thing where God blew up the deal, like he overloads the system. And when you can't see it, God will overload the system and break it. Do you remember that in the, in the uh, CD? Pastor talked about it? Okay, and in the book. So for me, I had to have the perfect little family. My kids always had to look perfect. They always had to be clean. They looked, you know, they'd go outside and play, and, you know, they couldn't be dirty. I'd have to change their clothes. If my husband sat on the couch and smushed the cushion when he sat up, I'd fluff it. I mean, it was insane. My house always looked like it was being shown for by a realtor. You know, any time a realtor could come in and show my house. I mean, I had three kids. It was insanity. Insanity. Every night, everything had to be put away. And my kids had to behave. So I looked good. Would that also come from, like, growing up in shame? Like, you could fall into that category? Oh, absolutely. Because... Absolutely. There was a lot of shame in my life as a kid. Absolutely. So, you know, then, you know, you're at church. You want your kids to behave. You want your kids to look like, you know, you really know God and you got it going on and whatever. Okay? Okay, Laugh. There by the grace of God. <laughs> I'm teasing. Anyway, 
It was true. I mean, you can ask Pastor, you can ask Pastor Tricia. I, I, seriously, it was very bad. I remember the first time I came, I said, I came, it was like in the firehouse, maybe like four weeks into knowing them. Um, I said, I really need help with one of my children. And he said, okay, come see me. I didn't know I was so messed up. <laughs> but he goes, well, when you start with you, then it trickles down to your kids, which is very true. So anyway, I, you know, I, it always had to be perfect. And if it wasn't perfect, you know, inside, at least on the outside, it had to look perfect. And the more I felt imperfect or out of control, the more it had to look perfect. And God said, enough, enough. And he didn't overload my system in terms of the way he did Paula's. But how many of you know when your world is trying to be perfect and your 19-year-old daughter gets pregnant, your perfect little world just got blown up. And it's not something that you can hide from people because it's very visible. And I was so grateful that I knew what I knew from Elijah House as to not what I just said would cause performance orientation in a child is to say the things like, oh, what a mistake, and say all the negative things over the baby that she was carrying because I knew what I knew. So I was grateful for that. But it blows up your perfect little world. And as hard as it was, I have to say, our church did a, my daughter would say, an A-plus job in loving her through it. A-plus. But part of me in the performance bracket felt relief that I didn't have to be perfect anymore, that I didn't have to pretend I was perfect anymore or put up, you know, strive for my kids to be perfect and push and push and push for them to be so perfect because everybody now knew it wasn't perfect. And it was actually a, a relief. Not that she was pregnant, but for me, it kind of took that whole thing away. And um, we got through it. And our little guy is now almost six feet tall and upstairs in a uh, youth group and loving it. So God makes good things out of messes, right? And I would say that going through it, it was the hardest thing things I have ever, one of the hardest things I've ever gone through, but out of that came one of the greatest blessings in my life. One of the greatest blessings in my entire life. I love that kid. Anyway, a need to succeed is part of performance orientation. And performance oriented people only like to do things that they know they can do really, really well because they don't want to take a chance of failing. We have some people raising their hand and shaking their head. <laughs> but do you see the ploy of the enemy in that? Because he's stopping you from your destiny. He is stopping you from your destiny. If you only will do what you are really good at and you're not willing to take a risk and to step into something new, how do you know you can do it or not? And the Lord's saying, do this, and you're saying, oh, I can't do that. I can't get it perfect. I can't get it right. I might fail. That's the enemy's plan to keep you in bondage and keep you from fulfilling your destiny. And it's also a, a way of controlling because as long as I can do it perfect, I can control the outcome. I can control the outcome, and I know that I'm going to get accolades or I'm going to get praise for this, and I'm not going to get... Oh, you didn't do that right. So take a risk and push through that place of, you know. I remember uh, Pastor Tricia said to me one time, she said, you're going to do it and you're going to do it afraid. And I was like, I don't want to. But when I did, I was so glad I did. She, was, she said to me, I'm going to be her, uh, 
her pastor was Bishop Bruno. She goes, I am going to be your Bishop Bruno, and I am going to kick you out of the nest and make you do things that you don't want to do. And I'm super grateful for that because there was a day where I would have never stood up here. Even though I was a teacher by trade, it's a little different when you're teaching seniors in high school versus your peers in front of you. And I wouldn't have done it because I was too afraid. I had done it once in my old church, and I put my head down on the thing. I had messed up, and I go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I messed up. Put my head down and walked out of there and said, I'll never do that again. I know. I made a vow. I had to break that vow. You're going to learn about vows and judgments. They are powerful things. And I'm going to tell you, if you didn't read, we don't have time to do that. But if you did not read the chapter on the law, the one that comes before performance orientation in the book, go back and read it. Because the word is the word, and it is very powerful. And you'll learn about more about it in Judgments and Vows. But if you didn't read that book, please do. And that, um, okay, they need to be complimented, what uh, Pastor Tricia was talking about before. And then they don't even believe the compliments that they get. They have suppressed anger. And they also, there's a thing... Um, and we were talking to somebody the other day about this in um, the ministry, in ministry, and it said, you know, there's a thing that you have to perform, 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 but you want to kind of know if I don't perform, are you still going to love me? So what happens is you blow up your own deal, self sabotage, because you want to know if I really mess up. Are you still going to love me? Yes. Go ahead. I did that. You did that? Yeah, but it was way before I was saved. Oh. Some girl I dated. I was one pushing the envelope to see how far I could go. Right. Well, that's thanks, Manny, for being so honest the whole night. Because other people have the same things that you're sharing. So thank you. Um, yeah, we push the envelope because we want to know. If I blow it up, are you still going to love me? Are, if I totally blow it up, is God still going to love me? And he is. But somehow our, the unbelieving part of our heart that still needs to get saved, because we know it, there's parts of our heart that still need to get saved. And if we struggle with performance orientation, that means there's a part of our heart that still needs to get saved. And, and you know, just pushed a little further down the angle scale. So they kind of blow up, we, you know, performance orientation people blow up their own deal sometimes. They can't receive criticism. They turn it around. They're compulsively defensive. Oh, I struggled with that so badly. Being defensive. If somebody told me something, I had to defend myself. Um, because to me, it was I wasn't going to be loved then. If you're telling me that, I have to be defensive because otherwise I'm accepting it. And then if I accept it, maybe you're not going to love me anymore. They're overwhelmed or over busy. Um, they, ta um, they take responsibility for everything. They can't say no. How many of us have done that? You just overload. Yes, yes, yes. You'll do another thing. Debbie's got her hand raised really high back there. Um, and then... Performance oriented people also put a demand on performing and don't, you, it robs the person of the joy of giving because they have to do it. Like you put the demand. I used to do that to my kids. And, and I realized like when I did, when they did it, what I wanted, there was no joy in it. Not for me, not for them. It was just because I made them do it. It was like a demand on them instead of them being able to freely say, hey, mom, let me help you. I demanded that they helped me. Okay, one of the major... Okay, the person is tired and ministers to others. This is um, one of the biggest signs of performance orientation is that you can minister to others, but you can't let others minister to you because you have to cover up what's going on inside. And if you let other people minister to you especially when you're in a prophetic church, then they might see something that you don't want them to see. Well, guess what? They probably see it anyway. So if maybe if you let them minister to you, they would um, get some revelation from heaven for you and you would get free. So 
I would encourage that, but that's a big, big sign of performance orientation. All right, performance oriented people usually work hard to, to be loved by serving others, but they cannot let others get close enough. There's no intimacy. And then they build resentment, anger, and bitterness. And in Galatians, it says, 5.13, it says, you, my brother, were called to be free, but you did not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather to serve one another in love, not perform to serve others in love. Big difference between performing and serving. performance oriented people can't give gifts without um, having to reciprocate. They try to control people in situations. They can't admit what they really feel. They are unable to be truly intimate. Did you ever, if you, you just can't let somebody close enough to you to let them know your real heart. And it's hard to be friends with somebody like that because you never get close enough to be able to do that. There's a constant need for approval. A constant need for approval. And every decision is based on what other people are going to think. You do things because, not because you want to do them, but what's that person going to think of me if I don't do it? Okay, the general rule, general results of it, of performance orientation are fear, striving, chronic fatigue, insecurity, compulsive need for approval. In extreme cases, it's depression and abusiveness. Performance oriented people lose their identity. And I remember a couple years ago when I was teaching it, the Lord gave me such a revelation on it. He, do you know, uh, remember when Batman, the Joker movie came out and that Heath Ledger guy was Joker, all right? And then he became so immersed in the uh, character that he ended up committing suicide because he became so immersed in the character. And when we get so, the Lord showed me, he said, when you, we get so immersed in performance orientation, we lose our identity. And when we lose our identity, we start killing ourself. The self that God wants us to be and who he wants us to walk in, we start killing that because all we can do is perform for others. It's like the dancing marionette. Like, okay, let me let them move the sticks a little bit more and I'll jump hot this high next time. We start to kill ourselves. And he won an Academy Award for that movie. And we win a, how many of us have won an Academy Award for performing for other people? Academy Awards. We're so good at it that we would win an Academy Award, but we lose because we lose ourselves in the midst of it. And we lose who God created us to be. And, you know, God puts a holy frustration in us. Until you walk in who you're called to be, there's going to be a holy frustration in you. And when you're thinking, what is wrong? Like, why am I so frustrated? Well, it's probably because you're not walking in who God called you to be. Ask God to show you where you're being held back. And, you know, there's... There's a lot of um, shame in that because if you're performing and then you don't perform right and then you know you're supposed to be doing this and God's calling you to do that and all you could do is perform for somebody else, shame starts to shroud you. And then you start looking at other people. Well, how come they're getting to do that? Well, maybe because you're performing and you're not being who God called you to be. You just, you can't compare yourself to that person because that person decided a long time ago that I don't care what John and Harry think. I'm going to be who God created me to be. I can tell you when there's people up here worshiping on Sunday mornings, you could tell the, you could tell the people who don't care what other people think. Amen. <laughs> it's right. Amen. It's, it, you don't care. It's like, I'm going to worship God with all my heart. I don't care what I look like, and I don't care what you think. 
<laughs> than this. I remember um, this one guy, this, this woman who came to our church, and her husband was Jewish, and he would come every once in a while. He goes, I like watching you worship, Cindy. He goes, you get your aerobic exercise and your, and your uh, worship in at the same time. He goes, that's pretty good. You, you saved yourself a trip to the gym on Sunday. Okay. Um, we'll just go to one more thing, um, and then we're just going to pray. Um, the biblical account for performance orientation, take a guess. Think of a biblical account that would be the... Yeah, that would be a good one, but that's not the one I'm thinking. Which one? Saw. Good. That's really good. Oh, I like these. And Mar- Martha and Mary, too. Go ahead. Well, she said it? Okay. What about the uh, prodigal son? The older son. He performed and he performed and he performed for his father. And when the younger son came home, he was angry because he had performed as well as he could perform. And his father gave everything to the son. And his father saying, but you had, you didn't need to earn my love. You've had it the whole time. You've had it the whole time. How many times do we do that? We're like, God, I want, I want, I want, I want. And God's saying, you've had it the whole time. When we don't have a revelation of the father's love, I'm going to go right back to where I started. When we do not have a revelation of the father's love, we are easily sucked into performance orientation. We need a revelation of the heart of God and how he looks at us. We need to be, orf- we need to be sons, not orphans. You know, he said he, was, he would be a slave in his father's house, that his slaves got uh, treated better than he was in the pig pen. But slaves earn their right, right? They earn their position, Sons have it. The cross did it. The cross earned our way for God to love us. And there is nothing we can add to that. There's nothing we can take away from that. We need to get grounded in his love. And I put the Father's love letter in, um, out there for you to read. And if you have never seen it, because we won't have time to show it tonight, but if you have never seen it, go to the original, le- the original version, 1999, of the Father's Love Letter and watch it tonight. It's eight minutes long. It is very powerful. All right. All right, we're going to just break some things, okay? Oh, yes, please. I want to make sure everybody recognizes that there's a way out because once you recognize that this is there, like we all suffer from it to some degree, no matter how good you were raised. So do you ever see, notice that if you buy a Toyota, you never owned one before, all of a sudden you see Toyotas on the road? Yeah. So like if you weren't really thinking about this before, now all of a sudden other people in your life, you're going to start noticing that they're doing it, right? And it's not just you. And so it's not like this is an uncommon thing. It's just... It's, it's, it's oppressive, right? And, and the Pharisees, going back to the story, what, the prodigal son, that was their big hang-up about Jesus. He wasn't making the, the lower class people live up to their standard. And that's a works mentality. I can follow the law better than you can. So God loves me more. And now all of a sudden, in that particular story in Luke 15, at the beginning of the chapter... Jesus is talking to the tax collectors and sinners. And they're mad. Who's mad? The Pharisees. So that's the older brother. But all of us have both of those sides in us. We have the part that's not doing so well, and God still loves that part of us. So my point is don't be discouraged and think, oh, my God, this is going to take forever to change. It doesn't. It really is very freeing to know that I have a target to shoot for now 
And like I said earlier, if you start getting angry at people that put that load on you, it could have been a mother or father. I'll just give one quick example. My grandmother, my mom's mother, lost her first child uh, as, as when she was pregnant. This is way back in the early 1900s when cars were just invented. And they were used to horses and wagons. And all of a sudden, she got hit by a car in Kearney on Kearney Avenue while she was pregnant. It flipped her up in the air. And she blamed herself really bad. My mother was the second child. So there's a lot of ladies here who probably know what I'm about to say. What's going to happen with the second child? I'm going to prove that I'm a good mother. And my daughter is not going to be a bad reflection on me. She's going to do everything right. So I grew up with a mom who was raised with performance orientation, and it was the same way. My mother would clean the house before the cleaning lady would come. I'm sorry if anybody here does that, you know, because I'm not trying to be. Uh, yeah, a couple hands went up. That might be a sign, you know, that could be a sign because you have to even impress the cleaning lady, right? Like, that's pro. And even like down the, we would have, we had a place at the shore, but it was hard for her to relax because she was always thinking about the schedule. And here we are, we worked all week and now we're at the shore. We just want to like relax, but you have to be home by a certain time and the food's going to be on the table. I'm like, order a pizza. You know, that we don't care about this. We're uptight all week. Let's not be uptight when we're supposed to be relaxing. But it was so built in. It took her really a long time to recognize it. And anyway, no, the point is, it's a process, and as you can forgive yourself, that's a really big part of it, and forgive the people that put it on you, you know, like coaches are f famous for this. And think about, anybody have to take music lessons? How stressful is it when the teacher comes the next week and you didn't get your lesson done and your father's sitting there watching, like, I'm paying money for this, you better do, you know, better do it right. <laughs> You're performing. Right? So look, it's not wrong to perform, it's wrong to do it for the wrong motives. Or coaches, like I said, like sports is all about performing. Nobody remembers who lost the Super Bowl kind of thing, right? You know, winning isn't, what is it, what's the expression? It wasn't, winning isn't everything, it's the, no, wrong, right? <laughs> wrong. No, you gain a lot by just participating, right? So anyway, you get the point, like, don't be discouraged that, oh man, this is such a mess. No, you know it now, and the Lord will help you you know, to, to identify the, the issues. And if anger rises up, that's normal. But just don't cook the anger. You know, release it. Forgive the people. And then also forgive yourself. Because that, that's a normal process in this whole thing. And I think Cindy did a great job. She's going to pray now. So. Yeah, you know, it's a lot easier broken than it is living through it. So, like Pastor said, it's like, it is a process, but... It's, you know, once you can pray through some of the things and break and forgive, it really shifts it pretty quickly. And when you start to see that, wow, the Lord loves me no matter what. And whether pastor loves me or my dad loves me or my kids love me, God loves me. Period. And we don't need to perform for him. And when we don't need to perform from him, we start to not need to perform for other people. Amen? Okay, so look at this piece of paper, okay? I, if you wrote something down on it, we're just going to pray through one, and then you'll see how to pray through it. And you can go home and write as many of these as you want, okay? But I want to give you the... Yes? Um, there's just um, one visual that's always helped me to get this concept. Good. Um, Rowing versus sailing. As Christians, a lot of times, we're rowing. We've got the oars and say, if I just pray enough, if I'm in the word, if I do this, if I do that, if I go to church, if I fast, if I da 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 if I this, if I this, if that, and we're rowing and we're rowing, we're trying to get to the other side, versus sailing. Sailing yeah, that's says, so good. Sailing says, you go with the wind, and the wind is the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that you just sit back in the boat and do nothing. <laughs> But you catch the wind. So it's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to go, you know what? Now, Peggy, today we're going to work with this issue about such and such. And there's such freedom in that because yeah, it's not amen. like, I've got to fix this. And I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it because, you know, I don't want to deal another day with this sin and what I'm doing. And you just, 
relax and go, okay, Holy Spirit, where are we going today? Papa, where do you want to go? You're in charge of this. And, and you know, I don't sail, but I know that you, you have to do things. You have to put mm-hmm. this out and catch the wind or whatever. So it's not that you're sitting back doing nothing, but you're not driving it. You're yeah. not striving in it. You're catching the wind, and the wind is taking you, and it's, and it's leading and guiding you. And therefore, how long or how short that getting to the other side isn't up to you. Amen. It's up to the wind to lead you and get you there. Amen. Amen. So it's a great visual. That's a really good visual. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. We even can, go ahead. You can, uh, you can even strive in your healing. Not that I know anything about that, but you can. <laughs> hey, real quick. Hey, church. Uh, this is my first time out tonight. Um, so thank you all. It's, no, it's been amazing. Um, and it's funny because, um, uh, had breakfast with, you know, some of the men this morning and pastor Peter and I, he mentioned, you know, make sure you come through now. I was like, yeah, definitely. Cause I told him that I've been looking forward to it. And I was scrolling through social media earlier and there was a meme it was a really funny meme. And you see a lot of memes that are usually centered around, um, uh, sometimes around race and culture and things like that. This one was like, in um, some homes you may hear, um, you, mother or parent knocks on the door. Hey, can you know I come in the door? And you got other families that say, you know, you don't pay bills in this house. Open this door right now. Um, and I thought of that. And, no, it hit me in my spirit because that's one of the things that I've heard uh, many times. But I even thought how sneaky money can be and the enemy can be because then, um, if it's a parent-child relationship, the authority was set when you were born, and so was the love. So whether you can contribute to the bills or not you still need to open that door. So if my parent loses a job, it doesn't mean that I now have more authority to keep you locked out. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. And, I, I, and this hit me like a brick, and I, I knew it was God speaking to me, so I wanted to share it. And, and I thought of that between um, children and parents, between marriages, same at the altar, the vow, the covenant was made. And I think it's just so beautiful when, when it comes to the family, children, when it comes to marriage, and when it also comes to the blood that Jesus said. It was the, the vow, the covenant, in those relationships, in that trinity, was set when it happened. And then those very manly things that happen after that don't determine the relationship. It was already set. Amen. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Amen. That's good. Yeah, it was set on the cross, is where, right? Besides what you were saying, but it was... When you were saying don't beat yourself up, it's a process. That's because the process begins very early and gets reinforced throughout your life. You know, it happens when you're a young one, when you go to school, certain teachers do it, people you date. It's just constantly reinforced throughout your life. So you have to just keep going back and getting rid of that and forgiving and forgiving. That's why it's a process. Thank you for sharing that. It's really good. And it is a process. And forgiveness is a massive part of it. Because you know what? None of us are perfect. And if you looked at your life, I'm sure there's some place where you put performance on somebody. She's got to run a long distance here. <laughs> perform, perform, perform. <laughs> faster, faster. <laughs> good job. <laughs> We okay. love you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. I know we got to go. Um, I'm trying to figure out my takeaway from this class, right? So when we leave from here, I, we figure out the root of the performance um, orientation mindset. Because um, if, if I'm a people pleaser, right, and I'm, I see myself through other people's eyes, and this is what I'm writing down, um, so I watch myself through others' eyes. I can't be in the moment and be myself. And I just want to die to self. So I'm free from me, therefore I'm free from you, like your opinions of me, right? So when I leave here and I see myself about to do it, or like if I mess up, because I get embarrassed even if I mess up, I'm like, oh, I didn't represent Christ right, or, you know, whatever. I'm supposed to say, I put down, my dear God loves you. You are loved by the Father. And just continually, I'm just, uh, that's my question. Um, Because I'm really trying to figure out what the root is. Do I need to know the root at this point or just try to get to the 
um, process of healing at this point. Because I don't know where it came from, but I don't care, and I just want to get to the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. We love you for you sharing. We love all the people that share tonight. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we do, but not for that reason. Um, it's always good to get to the root. It's always good to get to the root. Because where there's fruit, there's a root. So you want to make sure you get to the root. But going forward, even while you still don't know it, is a good. What did you say? Sail. Sail. Because Holy Spirit is so much better. You have a question, sweetheart? <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit is so much better at showing us than striving to figure it out. Because when you strive to figure it out, sometimes you start making stuff up in your head. Don't strive. The healing process is not to strive in. It's to, like, I love that visual. I won't forget that. So the other thing, Nadir, is the, if that thing has a power over you, there's some source of that power. So many years ago, I got a picture of one of those big old square batteries that have the two posts on the top, right? In, in order for that to generate power, both lines have to be connected. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Um, and it... Once you realize, I don't have to get jerked around by this thing anymore. I'm not going to be, my, my value is not going to be driven by what other people think of me because I can't perform perfectly every time. And I don't have to hide it and live in that lie. It's like disconnecting one of those posts, right? The, the power of it starts to leave you all of a sudden. You're like, wait a minute, no, I can't be perfect. It's not that you don't care what other people think. You should care what other people think, but it's just not the most important thing. So like, just disconnect the power source of that thing and, and recognize that God still loves you in, in spite of it and, and want, doesn't want you to be a failure. Like, you know, that's not his thing. But when you stop operating out of fear and you recognize it's operating out of love, you, stop, you don't fail as much because you're way more confident. Yeah, that's really good. All righty. We ready to pray? Yeah. Okay. All right, so look at this little sheet, and it says, if I don't, then I won't be loved. Or in order to be loved, I must. Okay, so I'm just going to pray, and you could put in your little whatever you wrote on there. And then you, I'm only going to do one, but then you'll be able to do it when you go home. And I would encourage you to do it, okay? So, Father, we just come to you, and we're just going to... Um, Father, we just come before your throne of grace, Lord God. And we thank you, Father, that your, your throne of grace is always open to us, that we could boldly run to it, Father God. It says boldly run. Father, we just come tonight, and we just thank you for what you've shown us, God. We thank you that you are the healer, God, that you are the revealer of secrets and the things that have been hidden for a long time, Lord God, even things that were reinforced and reinforced and reinforced as, um, is it Tom? Tom said, God, we just, uh, Lord, we know that some, th some of those things could even be hidden, God. But whatever it is, Lord God, you know. You know every single thing about us. So I come out of agreement. You can repeat after me. I come out of agreement <laughs> with the lie <laughs> that if I don't, you just say your thing. I will not be loved or accepted. I forgive every person in my life who helped contribute to forming that lie. And then in your head, just say who the people are. I forgive them. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for living my life based on that lie, for how I have judged other people because of it. I renounce that lie. I break its power over my life. I receive your forgiveness. And God, I choose to believe the truth that said, I am loved with an everlasting love by the King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords in Jesus' name. Okay, so you could do it the same thing for in order to be loved, I must, okay? Everybody gets it, how you do it? Okay, let's, um, let's just ask the Lord to forgive us for uh, being great actors and renounce that role of acting in performance orientation. So, Father, we come before you and we ask you to forgive us. You could just say it after me. I ask you to forgive me, Father. For living in the role of performance orientation and performing to earn love. I renounce that role. I am not going to be an actor in that role anymore. I break a soul tie with performance orientation and I cancel its power over my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, now I'm going to ask you all to stand, and we're going to pray through this prayer, the prayer to end striving, okay? All right, we're going to read it together. And sometimes when I read these glasses, I have to go back and get them fixed because I can, still can't figure out where they are. So if I read a different word than you do, just keep reading, <laughs> okay? I'm not going to perform for you. <laughs> I know I am loved whether I say the right word or the wrong word. I not, I, that was not true at all times. When we pray through uh, fears with people and it says the fear of reading out loud, that was one of my biggest fears growing up. So I have overcome. All right, so we're going to start. Lord, I have come to see my performance orientation I confess to you that although my head believes salvation is by grace, my heart drives me to earn favor, to be good enough to present myself to others and to you. I admit that I cannot change myself. The fear of not being accepted or loved is overwhelming. It puts me into gear and I begin to forming again. When acceptance is given with no strings attached, I cannot receive it. I ask you, my heart, for me, bringing my striving to death. I want to rest in your love. Help me to remove the hindrances that I have erected, which prevent me from entering into your love. Lord, I have been angry with you for putting me into this family, this position. I don't want my anger to keep me from you, so I ask you, you restore my heart. I forgive my family for... Everything. <laughs> you put whatever in there that you want. Okay. I ask you to forgive me for my anger, responses, my fear and insecurity, impure motives, and for not believing the truth. Lord, I renounce the family lies. You just put your own family lie in there. Okay, I accept my identity as your child. Help me learn how to live that identity in my daily life. Help me to feel, to know within me that success is simply being your child. Help me to be like you, Lord. I ask you to bring to death in me the structures, the pattern habits of performing I have created. You can just put yours in there yourself. I ask you to minister to the ambivalence in me when I want to correct, I want, yeah, me compliments, but can't believe them. Likewise, be the Lord of my tongue so that wisdom and kindness penetrate. Take my eyes off needs and fears. 
Lord, I resign from managing the universe. I give you my compulsive need to control people and situations. I recognize that I have wounded. Yeah, you could just say others and put whoever you have wounded. I always had to edit, add, or correct. I could always do it better. Forgive me, Lord, for both my insecurity and my arrogance, as well as for the wounds I have caused. Help me to believe that I am not responsible for all that goes on around me. Forgive me for always being a Martha, and help me to hear when I need to be Mary. Show me where I have taken on jobs or duties for the wrong reasons, and give me the wisdom to resign from them if necessary. Help me to fall in love with you, Jesus, so that what others think of me is not important. You have said it is enables us first to will and then act according to your good purposes. I want to be a good workman, but only with your strength and your will. Help me to be like you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I'm just going to release this scripture over you as we end. So, Father, we just thank you for what you've done and what has been broken tonight, God. We just thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Father. For some, it's the beginning of the end of performance orientation. For some, it's the, just the end of the last little bit, God. Wherever it is on the spectrum, Lord God, we just thank you for freedom. We thank you for freedom, God. We thank you for freedom, God, and we thank you for your love that is so unconditional, Lord God, that is so unconditional, Father, that there is absolutely no way we can earn it, Father, other than just being your kids. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing we can subtract from it, God. We're, when we say, Lord, be the Lord of our life, we have all the love that you can give us, Father. So I just decree over everyone come all you who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls and it says in another version there remains therefore a sabbath rest for the people of god the one who have entered his rest he himself also rested from his works as god did his so, Father, we just decree that rest, the end of striving, Father, the end of striving, and just the ability to rest in you, Lord God. Rest as your children, as your sons and daughters, just as sons and daughters, Lord God. We just break off the orphan spirit in the name of Jesus, which keeps us striving to earn your love and to earn the acceptance of others, Lord God. We just break off that orphan spirit right now in Jesus' name, and we just decree and declare that sonship is just descending on this house tonight, on every son and daughter in here, God, that there would be such a revelation of your love, God. I ask that you just saturate them to the core of their being, Lord, with the pour out your liquid love, God, and saturate them till they know they are loved and they are loved and they are loved, and they are loved, and love them not never comes into play, God. There's no petal on the daisy that says you love them not, God. And I just decree and declare that we are sons and daughters and no longer orphans, free to be who God created us to be, and that you will fulfill the destiny and purposes on your life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And we have a prayer team. If our prayer team would come up. Yeah. I also just want to let you know that we're going to email everybody the slides because there was a lot of really big meaty things in there that are good to, to focus on. So as long as we have your email, you'll get that, that deck of slides today. Do we have some? Uh-oh.